You're welcome back. Today, uh, or at this time, we're going to talk about um, something a little bit different from what uh, you've been hearing all the time. It's about health, and the health is a specific kind of health issue that we're going to be addressing about a specific uh, kind of gender, a specific gender. Uh, let me just tell you uh, what was obtainable in the days of yore. We know that there are so many men who married second wives, and guess why? because they know that at some point in the month, their wives, their first wives, were, were going to be um, menstruating. And because of that, some men stopped eating their wives' food when they are under that period. Some men married other wives that will not be under the period uh, uh, at the time the other wife is. And so many things happened. Some happened because of the kind of lifestyle that we're living. Some were used as excuses and all that. But right now, we're not even looking at the wife as it is. We're looking at the woman generally, and especially the young girls in our society. Underprivileged girls, especially in Nigeria, struggle uh, with sanitary uh, materials. And right now, we're going to be celebrating the World um, Menstrual Hygiene Day on the 28th day of May 2023. It's usually on the 28th of May every year. But today, we're going to be talking with an... Okay, I don't want to use the word expert. I want to use uh, uh, something else. With someone who has a burning desire, a burning burden to make sure that every young girl in our society uh, has access to these sanitary materials. And I am talking about Ms. Margaret Aladeshelu, who is a writer, a change maker, um, and a feminist. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay. From my experience with feminists in Nigeria, there are two types of feminists. I'd like to just know which of them you are. When you say you're a feminist, what do you mean about yourself? I think when it comes to feminism, there are so many misconceptions and actually a lot of people just choose to believe whatever they want to believe. They do not actually take time to educate themselves about what feminism is and you know the true essence of it. So for me, I would say my feminism, um, I just want to get rid of every form of inequality, every form of unfairness that comes with being a woman, um, uh, that comes with gender rather. I would love some sort of equality for both men and um, women. Actually, I think people do not understand the fact that feminism actually benefits all genders because when we're talking about feminism, we want the best for men, we want the best for women, we just want everybody in the world to be happy and comfortable irregardless of their gender. So I'd say for me, that's what my feminism is about. Okay, I needed to get that out of the way because yeah. some people, that feminism is just men hate us. You just hate men and then you are a feminist. You, you're fighting for the rights of women by just talking down on the men, challenging men in every way. And oh, actually, that. that's not feminism, that's misandry. So they tend to, people tend to like um, mix um, both together. I think that would be people that spend too much time on Twitter. When you actually take time to study what feminism means mm -hmm. outside of social media, yeah. you would understand that feminism is in fact a great thing. It's something that maybe fits every single person in the world. So it, it really, it really uh, beats me hollow when I see people calling themselves feminists and doing the kind of things they do, saying the kind of things they say. But that being out of the way, we're zeroing in on the fact that you have this burden that uh, some girls uh, do not have access to sanitary parts, for instance, and all that. And you started an agitation. So let's get a background, sort of, why you had to start this, what triggered it. Okay, so first of all, I kind of noticed that this is a conversation that people are not having. And at some point, I just had to sit down and I'm like, why are people not talking about this? And if people are not talking about something, you can be the conversation starter. So I went to a girls' school, uh, a single-sex school. I saw so many things in school, you know, being in that kind of environment where you're just surrounded by young girls. You see people's realities. You see, you know, you learn to recognize your own privileges as well. So um, while I was in school, um, People like Always and other like NGOs that um, deal with um, menstrual products, they would come to my school and they would share parts to every single person in the school. And then we would leave um, for assembly and would come back and would notice that parts are missing from our bags. You know, the parts that we've been given are missing for, from our bags. And I would say, like, wh what sort of person would steal parts? 
what sort of um, psychotic person will still part. Because at, at that point, I was still very, I was living in my own um, privileged world. I did not see a problem with the fact that, oh, girls that are not like me, girls that are not as privileged as I was at the time, probably don't have it as easy as I did. So then as I grew, I learned to realize that these people were still in parts because that was all they could do. That was the only way they could access um, menstrual products that month. That was the only way they could bleed without, you know, subjecting themselves to physical harm and all of those things. And you just start to realize that, okay, this is some sort of issue that we all need to be talking about. And lately, people have been talking about it on Twitter because I think we're all learning to just, like, see beyond our privileges. Period poverty is something that affects a certain demography of women. And that's, um, that particular demography of women are women that are often silenced, women that often ignore their stories and no, do not usually get out there. So that way you, you do not realize that it, in, it is an issue because people are not talking about it. These people that are affected do not have the resources, do not have the platform to talk about what they are going through and how it is directly affecting their lives. So that is why it's important for people like us that have the privilege, that have the platform to come out and say that, okay, this problem exists and we need to be talking about it. And I did not realize how much of a problem it was until um, my cousin directly suffered from it. So as at the moment, 37 million women in Nigeria suffer from period poverty. But when you do not know anybody that, direct, that is directly affected... Million, that's quite a number. That is quite a number, but you do not realize that because it just sounds like a number. It's just a number. That's why I'm not a numbers girl. So I'm a writer, so I'll tell the story instead. That way you can connect with this issue. That way that you, you can see that this issue actually exists. So my cousin, sometime in 2018, um, she had to write a jam exam. And she had to travel to another state to write that exam. She did not know she was going to get a period that day. It just came and it was quite like sudden. And she had not planned to, you know, spend, um, uh, I think uh, around that time it was 600 naira. A part was 600 naira. But at the time she already had money for transport. And it was either do I spend this money on part or do I spend this money on transport? How am I going to get home if I spend this money on part? So she went out there, she was asking people, adults, that um, please can you spare me 600, please can you spare me 600. And that went on for a while, and by the time she returned back to her exam hall, oh, they were already inside your, she could not enter, she could not write a jam exam, the exam she had traveled to write, she could not write it. And for the longest time, my cousin used to talk about, oh, I want to become a lawyer, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, and I knew how big she was on her education. And to see that it's something as natural, as biological, as a period that would stop her from being able to write her exam that year, that was very heartbreaking for me. And I think that was the first time I realized that, okay, this is an issue that exists. This is something that we need to be talking about. This is something that we need to do something about. I'd say for me, that was really like the eye opener. Okay. Um, that experience was in 2018, but yeah. when did you actually begin this advocacy? Okay, so last year I had the privilege to be um, one of the chain makers from We Create Chain Nigeria, that's uh, an arm of um, chain.org. And I told my sister, I'm like, I do not have such a large followership on his, um, social media. I'm not like exactly the face of period poverty. I do not, I didn't even know that my voice could hold so much power. So when um, Chain.org gave me that opportunity, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take it. What's the worst that can happen? And when I started my petition, I, had, I was struggling to get 100 signatures. Like that was from the beginning. My first 100 signatures came from personal contact and family and friends. So I was like, if I can't even get 100 signatures, if I can't even get 100 people to sign this petition and make them realize that, okay, this is an issue that exists, how am I sure that people are going to care? So for the longest time, I would say I held back on actually doing something because I felt like, why are other people not talking? Why can't other people do the talking? Mm -hmm. So I think in 2022, I just came to the realization that you can talk, you can be the conversation starter, and people are going to, you know, follow in that accord. So I would say yes, like that is actually when I came to the realization that I had to do something, I had to be the conversation starter. Yeah. Okay, you were struggling to have a hundred um, signatures, yes. but how much do you have it now? Um, as of today, I have um, 6,200 and something. By the time we update it and refresh, it would probably be more. Oh, okay. So when you get, put out a, a conversation like this and people are signing the petition and all that, where do you hope that petition signing will get you? 
Okay, so when you start a petition on chain.org, you kind of have to link your petition to a certain email address. So for every 6,000 people that have signed this petition, the Minister of Women Affairs in Nigeria has received 6,000 emails mm -hmm. regarding this issue. So she's very much aware of the fact that, okay, someone is petitioning against this uh, as an issue. And I, I think she's aware at the moment because I have also personally reached out to her via email, even though I got no response. But yeah, for every person that signs that petition, she gets an alert that, okay, this is happening. This, people are talking about this. They want you to do something. Will something be done? Do you hope that something will be I done? I genuinely hope that something will be done. By and the I, Nigerian government or another organization? Actually, I think... Menstrual products, uh, a lot of people do not know this, but menstrual products are actually, they are actually luxury to many women and girls in mm -hmm. Nigeria. And I think that's, that is quite a shame to the government of any country that uh, something as simple, something as, you know, as natural as a menstrual product would be referred to as luxury. So I genuinely hope that my voice would get to the right authorities, it would trigger them to do something, and we would actually be able to achieve like change with this petition. What is that something you want them to do? Because if, for instance, you're saying they should give it out for free, that will be the first thing in Nigeria that the government yeah. will give out for so. free. So maybe that is not realizable. Enough, actually, it, it, it wouldn't be the first thing. So when I was in university, we could walk into youth centers and get condoms. And I just used to think, you know, sex is voluntary. You can choose to have sex. And on the contrary, pads were sold for higher prices on campus. So let's say you get your period on campus and the normal price of a sanitary pad is 800. By the time you go to where you can, the only place you can get things on campus, you're getting it for about 1,500. And I just used to think, oh, this is such a problematic irony. So condoms are free. I understand that you cannot really compare well, like the, the way they're the, given by the Nigerian government or the United Nations or WHO. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure, but because we are talking Nigerian government now. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. So that's the issue. So how? What will? What will be the the end game as it is? What will be the the final thing that you'd want the government okay. to do? So at the moment, what I am petitioning for is for all taxes to be exempted from sanitary products, all sanitary products, tampons, pads, every single one of them. We want all taxes to be removed. Um, that is going to reduce the price of these products by a very significant amount, and it would make it more accessible for girls. So I think that is something that the government can do, and that is something that they should do. Yeah. Okay. Your voice is now being heard by the Minister of Health and all that. How much of this your voice is heard by international community? Um, so um, sometime earlier this year, Malala retweeted my, um, my petition, and that kind of came to me as a little bit of a shock because this was something that I was scared to start in the first place. So this was something that I wasn't even sure that you know it was going to garner like that sort of attention. And then one day I wake up and I'm getting like all these tags. I'm getting like all these retweets. And I went to my Twitter and I'm like looking at all these notifications and I realized that Malala had actually tweeted about it. And she's letting the whole world know that there is this 20 year old change maker from Nigeria that is trying to do this and trying to do that. And I think for me that was a, that was, um, a validation that I did not know that I needed. Mm -hmm. That was like I was doing something right and yeah. So, so far we've um, had the privilege to be featured on international publications as well. Um, my story has been told on assembly. So those sort of things make me like confirm that I am doing the right thing by starting this conversation and that the world is listening. So the world is re listening. Nigeria is seeing uh, how much has, uh, has the government or whoever is in charge or whoever is relevant to your cause responded to you? So far, nothing. So I've sent out, like I said, I've sent out emails as well. I've sent out official letters to people that I believe to be the right authority. But so far, we have nothing. But I am optimistic. I did not expect that this sort of change would happen, you know, in, what, six months. I knew that it would be something that I would have to continually, you know, strive for. It's something that I would have to talk about regularly. It's something that I would have to bring more attention to, more awareness to. So, yeah, I believe that something will be done eventually because we're not going to stay silent and we're going to keep pushing. Okay, but if you can't get the Nigerian government to respond, what other alternative do you have? What's the plan B? Like I said, awareness. So if the government is not going to um, respond, 
by the time we get gain a, a certain level, by the time we bring a certain level of awareness to this issue, and when that awareness spreads to like an international audience, I believe that the government would have to be held accountable at some point. So what we're going to keep doing is we're going to keep, you know, striving. We're going to keep pushing this issue. We're going to let the world know that okay, girls in Nigeria. For them, part is, parts are parts, tampons, all of these things, they are luxury, as it should not be. Their girls are missing school days because of period. Their girls are getting um, getting exposed to sexual assault because of their periods. Their girls are going through terrible, terrible ordeal just because of something as biological and simple as periods. So the world needs to know this. The world needs to talk about this. So at the end of the day, I believe that the go we, 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 we know that the government is not, uh, Nigerian government is not exactly the, the most um, easy to interact with or the most easy to get to succumb to a certain thing. So yeah, like I said earlier, I don't expect it to be easy, but that doesn't mean that we're going to stop anytime soon. But how are you interacting with the people who you are also helping? Because if you talk about removing the tax from uh, sanitary products, it means you're helping the companies that um, produce them and those that import the, the product. So, but you also talked about the fact that at some point, people who are responsible for producing or selling sanitary products used to come to a school and distribute this thing. So how are you relating with them? How are you talking with them? How, what is the level of talk you have reached with them to make sure that when this thing comes, it's going to um, be seamless? So are you talking with them or you're just uh, concentrating on the government? Honestly, for now, my major um, concentration is on the government. Because um, we've seen, one thing about us as Nigerians, we, we try to, you know, fix um, issues, like, we try to take it away from the government and we try to kind of, like, fix it on our own. And I feel like that has kind of taught the government of this country, it's, it's just like um, during the NSAS era, a lot of people were starting to talk, it, a lot of people were, try, were starting to hold the government accountable, and to them that was scary. So what I'm trying to do right now is hold them accountable. I'm tired of, obviously, I am very proud of the NGOs that are going out there in the streets, you know, trying to make sanitary products as accessible to girls as possible. That is great. That is good. But it can be better. We can do better. We can hold the government accountable because they hold the power to do more. They can do more if they want to. They can make sanitary products free if they want to. They are government of different countries that do that. If they can do that in those countries, we can do that here. There are governments that take about 50% of the actual prices of um, sanitary products, and they make it very accessible to people. So I think that the government can do more. But we would not be able to know how much they can do if we do not try to hold them accountable. Okay, let me di digress a little bit. We have like two minutes more to wrap it up. You're a writer as well, so I'd like yes. to pick in, have a peek into your mind as well. Uh, you're doing this advocacy on the one hand, and you're a writer on the other hand. What has influenced what? Is the writing influencing the advocacy or is the advocacy influencing the writing? I do not take one away from the other. So for me, writing is a tool for advocacy. You'd be surprised how much storytelling can do. So when you go to my portfolio, you check all my works, you can kind of direct all of them back to feminism. In every single bit of my writing, you would see my feminism. You would see what I am asking for. You would see my desire to drive change. So yeah, I would say I can't hear one from another. Google my name and you would see all the evidence of what I'm talking about. Like every single work that has been written by Ayala and Margaret Ayomiko can be traced back to women's rights and feminism. Okay, how much uh, of this work can be credited to you? Quite a lot. I think for, for my age, I think I have a quite a, an impressive um, number of works to my name. So, yeah. Congratulations then. So, Thank we'll you. be reading more from uh, Margaret. Um, I, get it, I get a tongue twist whenever I try to call this name. Alade Shelu. Right? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Good, yes. Or I was tolerable enough. I am manageable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are a writer, a change maker. Yeah. Um, you create change in Nigeria. You, and we are hoping um, to be a part of you, the process to mm. make sure that whatever you're advocating for, because we have girls, we have, we have sisters, we have children, yes. we have friends who are girls. And some of them will not never get to tell you these stories, the mm. things that you're talking about. Some have not used parts for a very long yeah. time. They use alternatives that may not be healthy enough for them. And so this advocacy is good, very, very good. Yeah. How else can Nigerians help you in this fight? 
as a final word, please. Thank you very much for saying that. So um, I think for people that want to help, you can go to chain.org, you can find my petition there, or you can go to my social media accounts where you can find my petition. Mm -hmm. And please retweet, please sign petitions, please talk about, when people are talking about these things, try to amplify their voices as well. I'm not the only person talking about pure poverty in Nigeria. There are other people talking about it. So as Nigerians that can't really do much, you can do so much by lending your own voice to the cause as well by just using your platform even though it's even if it's not as that big of a platform you can do so much with that with your hundred followers you can do so much by just talking about it here okay we've been hearing from uh, Margaret Aladishalu here on the show and been, she's been talking about pure poverty it's something that we need to uh, keep talking about if you have not talked about it before you have to start talking about now because it's an issue uh, that is very, very important. The girl child is there suffering, and without telling you, the suffering and in silence, and we have to be the voice for all these people that are not as privileged as some other people to have these things at their disposal. We'd like to say a very big thank you to you uh, for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Father. We do hope that this petition not only reaches where it should reach, but it should touch the heart that it should touch, and you get everything that you need. Thank you very much. Well, we, uh, it's a great way to wrap up today's show, but before we go, we'll leave you with the words of love by which you can catch souls. Let me take that again. Joy is a net of love by which you can catch souls. That's according to Mother Teresa, and that's how we wrap it up on the show this morning. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Let's do it again tomorrow. Bye for now. <laughs>